Dave Kraft. Hey, Katie. You wear it well, all this bad news. <laughs> What's happening in your uh, realm? Now, obviously, you uh, hooked up with Irene, and, and it was probably a, a good, uh, a beneficent pairing, given that she's in a different realm, the arts and storytelling, if you will, and, and but she's she's shedding light on a story that you need for light to be shed on for your work to um, be stronger or be amplified. So we, we kind of see this as uh, two aspects of the same thing. For, you know, for years, our organization has dealt with a lot of the technical stuff about Chernobyl, the numbers, the figures, the blah, 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 mm-hmm. dealing with the industry folks, confronting the government folks. What's important, though, and we learned this the hard way, or maybe the good way, is the human message about this. Because those were real people who got irradiated. Yeah. And those are real people who died and, and real people who got chased from their homes forever. Over 200,000 people lost their homes. Uh, these are real people whose kids have birth defects and deformities. And we actually ran across that face-to-face when some friends of mine from Michigan brought eight kids over as part of the Chernobyl Children Project. Uh, This has been going on in Ireland for decades, ever since the accident happened, where they literally take kids out of Belarus, and and now there's another group doing it in Ukraine, and many groups do this now, and bring them out of the zones for two to three months to get medical treatment, to get better nutrition, recreation. It's sort of like summer vacation or summer camp. Uh The deal is, though, the kids we met were all either blind or visually handicapped uh. and, and went to Western University, Michigan, Michigan for uh, evaluations. And when I read the medical reports from all of these kids, every one of them said the condition is consistent with the effects of ionizing radiation. And they were all born or shortly thereafter around the time of the Chernobyl accident. This nailed it for me. It's like you can pile the statistics as high as you want, you know, and, and it, it doesn't touch the real. meeting somebody who was affected by this. Well, so the work Irene is doing brings it down to a, a much more human level, and sure. it's the level that we need to confront in Illinois because we have 14 of these, these things that could go off in their own way at any time. You'll yeah. never have a Chernobyl here, and we're not worried about having a Chernobyl here, but you could have a Dresden, you could have a Braidwood, you could have a Byron. That's what we're concerned about. And with this so-called nuclear renaissance whitewashing all the facts again, we're back to square one confronting yeah. the, bull, the bull stuff. <laughs> and, um, well done. Thank you. I catch myself Pulling occasion. back there. But so for, for us, this is about history. This is, this is whether George Orwell was right or wrong. This is whether Winston Smith is going to roll over in his grave. Because right, they have whitewashed the Chernobyl issue so badly in fact, the 20th anniversary, both of us were in conferences in different cities uh-huh. where the governments are saying, oh, yeah, it was rough, but the accident's over. Now you can buy our vegetables and come on vacation here. And So when you say they, uh, they are whitewashing, who's the they? Yeah, the governments of Ukraine, the governments of Belarus, the governments of Russia, the governments of the United States, the International Atomic Energy Agency, which is the United Nations Agency, which just says everything is... It was sad, and maybe 4,000 people will die overall, but get over it. Well, already we know that over 30,000 people are dead, so their numbers are just total trash. But they're the ones who have the big budgets. They're the ones who have the publicity machine to crank out the nonsense. Mm -hmm. So we're here to confront uh, a whitewashing of history of the worst nuclear accident that we've ever had. And that acts as a warning so that we don't have one again in the future. This is why Irene's work is so important. Right. So what what are you um, currently, Dave, trying to influence people into doing regarding the current state of nuclear power? Uh, you know, you mentioned that we've got 14 reactors. We're sitting in the middle of a nice little semicircle or almost complete circle when you think about what's on the other side of the lake of nuclear reactors here in Illinois and in Chicago area. Um, what should we be doing? What should we be doing to avoid um, going forward ignorantly into um, some real terrible, scary stuff? Well, I'll clue you in on some things happening here in Illinois because uh, it's been very troubling the last uh, two or three years in particular, but the last nine years generally. 
the nuclear industry is buying itself a, what they call a nuclear renaissance. Yeah, we made mistakes before. Yeah, it was expensive, but we learned our lessons, and we're going to do it much better, honest. And this has been going on since 2000, when they actually had their conference here at the Palmer House in Chicago. Mm. And we, of course, gave them a good Chicago greeting outside. I bet. And uh, we're saying, wait a minute, you know, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. So they have been pitching this nuclear renaissance about having better designs and all this. Well, the numbers just are not there. And particularly in Illinois, it was astonishing that a legislator in the state legislature proposed a couple years ago, just two years ago, that we should start building nuclear reactors again. Now, we have a law on the books that says, wait a minute, you can't build any more nukes until you have a place to put the waste. Now, this made sense to me because I asked the nuclear people, would you authorize the building of the Sears Tower or the John Hancock Center without bathrooms? Because that's essentially what the nuclear industry has done. They've built a whole industry with no place to put their crap. So we're, and the law was very clear. It was, it was to prevent Illinois from, from becoming a dumping ground that was out of control. Well, these legislators now feel, well, it ain't so bad, you know. But we're dealing with Springfield, so we know that there are mental deficits that we're dealing with and mm. they have to be overcome. <laughs> we thought once was a joke, but the second time around, uh, this year again, they came back and introduced the same legislation. To his credit, Mike Madigan has bottled it up and wouldn't let it proceed. Amazing. And, and Barbara Flynn Curry was right in there fighting with us and a lot of other legislators saying, this is nuts, so it ain't going anywhere. Trouble is, you know how politics goes. Is so you, you're going to pull back a little bit on that, that brain deficit remark. There are a couple brains working on the... We do have heroes and right heroines, on. absolutely. There you go. But right. you've got to wonder what's in the water in Springfield. Uh, I, don't, I, I, yeah. wouldn't I wouldn't touch it. I wouldn't touch it. So they're back, and we know that they're being pushed by the nuclear industry to, to push it in Illinois. So we're taking the whole summer, getting petitions, getting organizations to endorse just what's on the books, the law that's on the books. No more nukes until you've got a place to put the waste and support the renewable portfolio standard, which requires that these utilities have to generate 25% of their electricity by renewable sources by the year 2025. It's on the books. We're not asking for anything new. Just follow the law. So that's our summer project. How, do people, how do people help or get informed yeah. about it? If you go to the NEIS website, which would be www. N-E-I-S, that's our acronym, dot org, uh, you will find the petitions and the forms that you can download to circulate amongst your office, your church, your school, your congregation, whatever. And there are also official endorsing forms that organizations and businesses can, can sign. Now, I, I stress businesses because ultimately the businesses are the ones who, who really get the economic uh, detritus from all of this because if we are saddled with high electric rates, which we had been when the first go-around of nuclear building took place, businesses get driven out of state because they can't afford the power. We're afraid this will happen again. So it, businesses have a real strong stake in making sure that the so-called nuclear renaissance goes away. Well, and absolutely true now because the ComEd's rates jumped in the last year right. uh, now quite I, a bit. Quite i got to point out that because of the change in the law, uh, ComEd is sort of separate from the nuclear part. How does uh, that happen? In, in the late 90s, the so-called move to deregulation or re-regulation split these big companies up into functional units. So technically, Commonwealth Edison doesn't generate anything. All they do is they service your wires, your poles, your oh, transformers. Yeah. They dig holes in the street. They fill them back up, and they keep the lights on. But Smoke and they mirrors. buy their power from the parent company, Exelon, which is largely nuclear. Mm -hmm. And so that's where the connection comes in, is who they buy their power from. And if you're going to buy expensive nukes, then, of course, your rates are going to go up. Right. 